Well, good afternoon, everybody. Everybody hear this okay? Not too loud. My name is Howie Newman. This is my uh, musical baseball show. Uh, let me explain what it is, what you signed up for here. I'm going to be doing some baseball songs, most of which I've written, but there will be a few songs that you know. And we'll be doing some trivia. I'll be telling some stories, and we'll be doing some other stuff. So, uh, yeah. I want to try to make this as interactive as possible, so if you have a question or a comment or whatever, feel free to speak up. Only between songs, though, not, not in the middle of the song. So, uh, before we go any further, I want to just get a sense of uh, what kind of demographic I'm looking at here. So, <coughs> demographic, yeah. So, uh, how many of you are like diehard baseball fans? Oh, that's good. And how many of you are just kind of casual fans? And how many of you are only here for the food? <laughs> All right. Can you hear well, you can, you can well, baseball fan and food? Yeah. All right. Well, okay. here. Anyway, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself before Great. we get started. Um, I was a sports writer for 18 years. I worked for the uh, Patriot Ledger, the Boston Globe, the Lowell Sun, Associated Press. I did radio for the uh, Lowell Spinners. And uh, I covered the World Series in 1985 and 1986. Though so in uh, 1985, I did not have a laptop. That's because nobody had laptops. <laughs> in fact, there were, in fact, there were portable computers, but it's not something you'd want to put on your lap. Trust me. So when I when I covered the series that year, and it was between St. Louis and Kansas City, in order to file my story, I had to go to the Associated Press office in the city where the game was being held, and uh, type on their computer and send it to my newspaper. So uh, it was a lot of fun driving around in a rented car in a strange city in the middle of the night trying to find the office. But uh, apparently I, I had found all the offices and uh, everything worked out fine. But the following year, 1986, I got one of these, which was the Radio Shack TRS-80. It was a, this was a landmark technological advance. Trust me, you, know, you could actually type your story on this computer and hook it up to a phone line and send send the story into your newspaper. So there was a, it was terrific. Uh, there was no internet back in eighty eighty six, so you had to use telephone. Line. And it was kind of crude. I mean, you can see the small screen, only like got five lines on it. And it had, had a TV uh, like that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. it had twenty five thousand bytes of memory, so you could get about five stories on here, and then you'd have to start erasing stuff. So uh, com to compare this to a, the average smartphone. This has the memory of 0.00008% of uh, an average smartphone. That was uh, very, very... I have a yeah. question. Yes. The World Series in 1985 between the Kansas City Royals and the St. Louis Cardinals, was it? That's correct. Were they arch rivals? Well, they were in the same. Well, that was a joke because, you know, the... the, the oh, the arch. Oh, I see. Okay, all right. All right. You're going to eat... Ask me if you can have that one. Yeah, I, I should probably, yeah, probably use that one. <laughs> Write that down. And, and I, I will, as soon as I, uh, I finish here. Anyway, um, and I've been a huge baseball fan for a long, long, long time. I've been to 95 major and minor league ballparks. Uh, I added number 95 this year when you see the Woo Sox, which uh, I highly recommend. It's great. 95 major and minor league ballparks. That's even more impressive when you consider the fact that my wife would rather get a root canal than go to a baseball game, so I had to kind of do this stuff on my own. And I've got a couple of uh, I've got a couple of baseball CDs, uh, and they're both in the Hall of Fame archive in Cooperstown, New York, which is across from the Navy Museum, and uh, has all the printed material and recordings and things like that. And uh, in the next room over there, I, I do have my my uh, display of personal baseball memorabilia, so feel free to check it out. Uh, mm -hmm. The show is over. Or if you get bored, do it during the show. I don't care. You know? Anyway, so anyway, I'm going to start off with a uh, song about a ball player you probably never heard of. But maybe that's the purpose of this song. I don't know. But his name is Mike Hessman. And uh, Mike Hessman, he holds the record for the most home runs hit in the minor leagues. So uh, it's, it's kind, of, kind of a dubious record, you know. He, uh, he had 433 home runs in the minor leagues, which is a tremendous accomplishment, but he also had to spend 20 years in the minors to do it, which is probably not what, not the idea that uh, he had for a career when he, when he first embarked. It's uh, crazy he never made the majors. Well, it was well, he did make the majors. Oh, he did? Okay. It's, and it's in the song. Oh, okay. and, uh, but uh, yeah, he did make the major leagues, and he had some more home runs in the major leagues. Um, 
And so I wrote the song, recorded it, put it on my album, and uh, I sent it out to him, and I was kind of curious to see what he thought of it. So I actually caught up with him a few years ago. Uh, he retired after the 2015 season and uh, became a pitching, became a hitting coach in the minor leagues. And uh, so he was uh, worked with the Erie Sea Wolves that year uh, in the Double A Eastern League, and they had a double header up in uh, Portland, Maine. So I drove up there and. Uh, chatted with him and took the photo together. The photo was on, on the table over there. And he has no regrets about his baseball career whatsoever. Uh, he enjoyed every minute of it. He, he, played, he had a very interesting career. Uh, he played uh, 20 years of professional baseball. Uh, he played for 16 different teams. Uh, there were three seasons in which he played for four different teams. Because uh, he, he had power. He was a big, strong guy who had power. So, uh, you know, he'd get sign a contract, get released, and somebody else would pick him up. So, uh, so anyway, so but he, he did love playing the game, and uh, that's kind of comes out in the song, and this is called the uh, Ballad of Mike Hesman. Nope, you're not getting it. Dick Stewart, 66. Correct. 66 wow. was that? 69. 66 home runs. Right. In the minor league. Right. Yeah. I knew that. He wrote, he, wrote, he wrote it on the globe, right? You, you write it, you write it, right? I, 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 that's an old, I've known that for a long time. Well done. He was a 
Dick Stewart, they called him Dr. Strange. You know, he would have been a great DH, but didn't have DHs when he played for I college. know, but they, that was good. No. They added a little color to these. I'll be talking about the DH okay. in a while, so we can, we can take up that discussion uh, mm -hmm. in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to do my first trivia question here. This is my favorite tri trivia question because it harkens back to a, to a different era. So can you name the pitcher who holds the record for the most strikeouts in one game? <coughs> Roger Clemens. Roger Clemens? That's, that's not correct, but it's a, it's a good guess. Is that Pedro Martinez? Yes. Kofax? Martinez? Pedro? That's, uh, that's Sandy not correct. Sandy Kofax? That's not correct either. But, uh, no. Nolan Ryan. No. Nolan? I think Kofax had 18, and Nolan Ryan had 19 a few times, but that's not uh, correct. Uh, Clemens had more than I know, that. I know, Babe Ruth. You know what? I looked up some of the records of some of the older pitchers, and Babe Ruth, I think, averaged about four strikeouts a game. Back in the days when he played, strikeouts were not a big deal. Can I ask what era this was in? This was in uh, the 1960s. Yes, sir, in the back. Well, I, I'm going to kid that time. There was an article in the New York Times a few days ago. I don't know. Oh, the reading the New York Times is cheating, you know that. <laughs> no, Evil okay. Empire. Minor, minor leagues? <laughs> no, this is major leagues. Oh, okay. major, most, most strikeouts in major leagues. What, what's the record in the minor leagues, though? 27. Why? Like last Sunday, um, a guy in the Pittsburgh for Class A team for the Pirates in 1952 pitched a perfect game and struck out all 27. Really? Wow, yeah. that's pretty amazing. <coughs> I thought that's what Okay, well, the answer is... Uh, Randy Johnson. Yeah, those, that's a good guess. Okay, okay. so yeah. the, if you mentioned Randy Johnson, Roger Clemens, Kerry Ward, or Max Scherzer, yeah. each of those guys has struck out 20 batters in a nine-inning game. That's the record for nine innings. Oh, but... Gosh. You go back a few years, and the pitchers, they just used to pitch the whole game. You know? oh, yeah. so, so in 1962, Tom Chaney of the Washington Senators struck wow. out 21 batters. Wow. In a, How in many? 21 okay. in a 16-inning complete game victory over the Baltimore Orioles. Wow. But didn't Clemens have 21 also? No, he had 20. I mean, he did it, he's the only one who had done it, have done it twice. Okay. But, uh, you know, back in the old days, they used to just pitch, uh, yeah. pitch the whole game. All right, so now I'm going to do a... Uh, a song about a, a ball player that you, uh, you probably have heard of. Uh, his name is Johnny Damon, and uh, he was very instrumental in the, in the Red Sox winning the World Series in 2004. I mean, he could do a lot of things for you. He could, one of the he, idiots. He, that's right, he was one of the gang of idiots. He could, he could run, he could hit, he could hit for power, he could field. He couldn't throw worth a damn. But, uh, <laughs> Looked like Jesus with the hair. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, he had uh, a lot of big hits that postseason. He had a grand slam against the Yankees in the seventh game of the league championship series, broke that game open. And he had four extra base hits in the, in the World Series that year. The following year, he batted 316, which was his all-time career high. And over the winter, he became a free agent. And he did the unthinkable, which was to sign a contract with the New York Yankees. So, uh, for a mere... $12 million more. But he had to get his hair cut, he had to get his So uh, I wrote a song about it. People thought it was pretty amusing uh -huh. back then. But after a few years, it got a little dated, you know, so I stopped playing it. So, But now it's like nostalgic, it's retro. Mm -hmm. So the song is making me come back. <laughs> why did you go, <coughs> Johnny Damon? Why did you take the cash and run? Do you think in New York City you'll be having this much fun? They cut your hair, they shave your beard, you smile, you say no thanks. We don't love you anymore, now you're with the gangs. Perhaps they didn't tell you, perhaps you did not know. Left center fields, 450 plus, I ain't gonna make that throw. There's locks for brown to cover, you get the slower every year. And I've been by mid-July, you wish that you were here. Why did you go, Johnny Damon, why did you take the cash and run? Be a link in New York City, be having this much fun. They cut your hair and shave your beard, you smile, just say thanks. I don't love you anymore, now you're with the gangs. Now Georgie don't like losing, Georgie 
Find us beyond the dark. If you don't hit 300, life will never be so hard. And if you don't make the playoffs, win a couple rounds. Fans will cuss and swear at you, run you out of town. Why did you go, Johnny Damon? Why did you take the cash and run? Do you think in New York City you'll be having this much fun? They cut your hair and shave your beard and smile just in a nice. We don't love you anymore, now we're in the gangs. They did have a long-range plan because uh, Coco was kind of an average player. They had this hot shot in the minor leagues. His name was Jacoby Ellsbury, and he became the center fielder before too long. So I actually rewrote the final chorus to reflect that bit of information. And uh, and then Ellsbury signed with the Yankees too. So I said that. You know, actually, Coco was a pretty good ball player. It was yeah, was very good. He could run. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna. Four, six, eight, ten. Not gonna need a guitar for this thing. So I'm gonna tell you a little story. <clears throat> so this is all about a uh, a national campaign that I did in 1985 to get rid of the designated hitter rule. Uh, I never liked it. Uh, but before I go any further, I want to see where you people stand on this issue. So uh, how many of you liked the designated hitter rule? And how many of you yeah. don't like it? Yeah, I like it and I don't like it. Okay. And how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? I don't. <laughs> okay. Well, so I will, explain, I will explain for those of you, because you, you'll have no context unless you understand what, what the rules are about. So the designated hitter rules developed for the first time in 1973. And uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, the offense in baseball was dwindling, is spiraling downward at an alarming rate. There were less hits and less home runs and less runs, and the owners were getting fearful that, uh, that the fans were going to lose interest in the game because there wasn't enough offense. So they decided to try out this new rule called the designated hitter or the DH rule as an experiment, and then they later, uh, they later instituted it permanently, and whereby the pitcher doesn't have to hit. Typically, the pitcher is not, right. not a great hitter, so they figure, take the pitcher out of the line, right. put a guy in, and hit, who, all he does is hit, and it'll create, create a little more offense, and you basically you have two players that are splitting one position. You have the pitcher who pitches and doesn't hit, and the, the designated hitter who hits, but doesn't play the field. And to me, uh, it takes a lot of strategy and a lot of color out of the game because if you're managing and you have to make a pitching change, well, you don't have to, without the DH, you have to worry about where the pitcher is in the lineup, who you got to pinch hit, who's in the bullpen, all this other stuff. The other side of that is that if you have a player who can't play uh, defense very well, like Dick Stewart or JD Martinez or whatever, you got to, you know, without the DH, you got to figure out a way to get him into the lineup and, and not hurt the team. So it takes a lot, a lot out of it. And, but the main objection that I, that I have to the designated hitters is that we don't get to see a lot of the really good hitting pitchers hit. And uh, there were a lot of real good hitting pitchers. Rick Wise, I, I'm sure you remember him, he pitched for the Red Sox in the 70s. Yeah. He had perhaps the best individual game in the history of baseball. Uh, pitching for the Phillies in 1971, he threw a no-hitter and hit two home runs in the same game, which is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, Earl Wilson uh, hit 35 yeah. career home runs and played for the Red Sox for quite a number of years. 35 career home runs, including two as a pinch hitter, because he was a big, strong guy. And they, they I think another him. good hitting pitcher back then was Warren Spahn. Warren Spahn was very good. He had about, he, he uh, hit, I think, 
36 home runs or something like that. Okay, he, somewhere somewhere like 30. 30. Yeah, he was very good. Because back in the, back in those days, if you wanted to be a winning pitcher and a, and a good teammate and a, you know yeah. someone who was valuable, you learned how to hit. And you, and you worked at it. How about Jim Lombard? Jim Lombard was a good hitter. Uh, Jim Tobin pitched for the Boston Braves in the 40s. Only pitcher ever to hit uh, three home runs in one game. So anyway. I decided I'm going to do this national campaign, you know, to get rid of the designated hitters. So, uh, the National League had a National League city group this year. Yeah, I know it's terrible, but anyway. You're uh, actually, uh, I like Mercury better. Anyway, um, well, everybody has their opinion, and there's no right or wrong opinion. But that's just my opinion. Um, so, in order to run a national campaign, you've got to have a catchy slogan. So, this is my slogan here: is dump the DH. And uh, there were a lot of dental hygienists who totally, totally misinterpreted this and I took great offense to it. But, so anyway, so I, I, uh, I, I decided I'm going to promote this. So I, I put together a brochure and a bumper sticker. I sent it out everywhere I could think of. Newspapers, magazines, radio stations, TV stations. And it was the 1985 version of going viral. I mean, it just absolutely went nuts. Um, it was in the New York Times. I, I did a piece on TBS uh, cable. Um, I did 30 radio talk shows. And uh, I actually got into, I, they did a nice piece in Sports Illustrated, which is actually on the table over there. They came to my house, took a photo, and uh, wrote, wrote up a, a nice piece. And I was selling these things for like a couple of bucks a piece to, uh, to finance the campaign. So once, once it ran in Sports Illustrated, which has a global distribution of like four million people at the time. I started getting mail from all over the world. I mean, people were sending me cash from New Zealand, and I got a money order from Saudi Arabia, and, uh, Australia, Europe, Canada, Mexico. It was kind of nuts, you know, and I sold like 1,200 bumper stickers. And, uh, the, crowning, uh, the crowning experience of this whole thing was that uh, the bumper sticker got into the Baseball Hall of Fame. It's in. It, I have a picture of that also out on the uh, table over there. So it's in a glass case with my, my name under it. And, uh, so so I, I looked at it this way. It's like so. I David Ortiz and me were both in the Hall of Fame. But you know, if my dump a DH campaign had worked, you know, he probably wouldn't have been in the Hall of Fame. But that's the here right there. But anyway, so so what happened? Did the campaign? There was supposed to be like a fan poll to. Uh, to determine whether they were going to keep the DH. The fan poll never happened, so uh, the campaign really had no effect on anything, and the American League kept the designated hitter rule, and unfortunately the National League adopted it this year, so uh, we'll never see pitchers hit again. It's kind of sad. But, you know, I had a lot of fun doing this, uh, did a lot of interviews and things, and uh, got into the Hall of Fame, so can't argue with that. Rick Fasella was a pretty good hit pitcher. Yeah, he had a three-run double. Uh, he, 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 Arod, Arod was a pretty good pinch hitter, too. Right? Yeah, now, there were a lot of good hitting pitches, so it's sort of like a, a wild card in the lineup for you, because uh, yeah, you don't know if the pitcher can hit or not. I mean, if the pitcher can hit, uh, you know, it's a great advantage. Chris Sale, I think, is a pretty good, uh, Babe Ruth. Pretty good hit. Babe, Babe Ruth was a <laughs> prime example of that. They, if they had had the designated hitter rule back when Dave Ruth was playing, then he never would have become a, an outfielder. He, baseball wouldn't have been saved. The entire evolution of the universe would have changed. And uh, I wouldn't be standing, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. So, uh, forgot to mention the good old Babe Ruth, best hitting pitcher of all time. So one of the great feats of hitting by a pitcher, which I intentionally omitted, was... Uh, was done by a guy named Tony Cloninger. For the Braves. For the Braves. Anybody know what Tony Cloninger did that was famous? He hit, he's the only pitcher ever to hit two grand slams in a game. I think I've seen that, yeah. And uh, back in 1966, he did it, pitching for the Atlanta Braves. And uh, he had nine RBIs in the game, which is the team record, remains the team record. So Hank Aaron, Eddie Matthews, uh, Joe Whitecock, none of those guys ever had nine RBIs in the game. I thought pitcher hitting two grand slams in a game, that's, that's definitely worth a song. Yes, now, there are two things you got to know about this song to fully appreciate it. So, um, the first is, is that uh, 
when you have a nine-man lineup with, without the DH, that the, the number eight hitter has a tough job because he gets right in front of the pitcher. A lot of times, they're they're gonna walk him either intentionally or unintentionally. Oh yeah. Get, How about the pitcher? Excuse me. He was an outfielder. Six. 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 Anyway, so the, the, in this in this particular day, uh, uh, Dennis Menke was the, was the number eight hitter in the lineup. He's a pretty good ball player. And uh, first inning, there there were two men out and a couple of guys on base, and they decided they're going to walk Dennis Menke, pitch to Tony Clevenger. So he hit a grand slam. Three innings later, the exact same scenario presented itself. They did the same thing, and uh, Clevenger hit another grand slam. Twice in one day. That's how. It that strategy didn't work out too well. The other thing you got to know is that, you know, when you write songs, you try to rhyme things. So nothing rhymes with Cloninger. So his nickname was Tony C. And, uh, and I realized that when you think of Tony C, you know, you think of Tony Finigliero, who was a Red Sox uh, star at a very young age. But uh, so I called this song the, the Other Tony C. July the 3rd, 66, baseball history in the mix. That day, the Giants played Tony, clung to her and prayed. Tony C was on the hill, you don't remember him. Now you will, it was his claim to fame after Grand Slams in that day. Start the day, two men off, two way. It was only the first inning, but the fun was just beginning. As Mikey walked to the plate, the skipper heard and Frank said, Wait, the strategy is clear, let's walk then. And pitch the tone to see. I'm in number four by nine. Ring's got more. Tory reached, so did Bowling. Two men out, they were rolling. Then he walked up to the plate. Skipper heard a price said, wait. Mike can't strike twice. Let's walk then. Pitch to Tony C. Long flat ball, the baseball sword right over the wall. Tony C, touch the ball of that story game. Four runs in, just one swing, pretty good, beautiful thing. Once around, it's pretty nice. In that game, he did it twice.
Right. Before we know the answer to this, who was the only player to hit a grand slam from both sides of the plate? Two, two grand slams in the same game. Uh, was it Bill Miller? Bill Miller. Yeah. Number nine hitter. Yeah, it's a number nine hitter. And he won the uh, batting title that year. That's right. And there are only about 13 players, I think, uh, have hit two grand slams in one game. He hit him from one three seven. Now, you know Fernando Tatis Jr., uh, his father set a record that he's, he hit two grand slams in one inning. What was his wow. father's name? His father's name was, what was huh? his father's name? That didn't do it. Pardon me? No, I mean, what was his first name? Fernando Tatis. Oh, it was Jr., he was a Jr., I'm saying that. I don't I remember, I remember him playing. Play. Was, yeah. was he in the majors? He played, yeah, he was a good player. I don't remember him. Yeah. No. Now you do? Well, All right, another trip, time for another trivia question here. There you go, Going back to 2004 again. And uh, the Red Sox pulled off a big blockbuster trade in the middle of the season. Oh, sorry. They traded, they traded uh, no more Garcia Parra of the Chicago Cubs. So can you name, they received two players in return. Cabrera, Menkovic. Okay, this, this trivia question, that's correct. This, Who had uh, the baseball in Folk Warner and you wouldn't give it to him? Yeah, to so that this, this, this song kind of, that this trivia question kind of segues very neatly into this song. Yeah, it was a, uh, but you didn't pronounce his name properly. For Cabrera, no. No, Cabrera, you got right. You know, oh, Mekovic, wasn't Mekovic? Yeah, well, that's not pronounced. Didn't, so didn't they get, didn't get Robert here too, the uh, one that stole the second? I'm not sure what they got. Any, anyway, anyway um, so it was, a, it was a very complicated trade. It was four, four teams involved. It was the Red Sox, the Minnesota Twins, the yeah. Montreal Expos and the Chicago Cubs and the uh, Red Which Sox traded Walmart to the Cubs and then they got uh, Cabrera, Orlando Cabrera from the uh, Montreal Expos and okay. they got Doug Minkiewicz. Minkiewicz, okay, that was close. So, Doug Minkiewicz. You got half a point for that? Yeah, you got half a point. <laughs> Doug Minkiewicz from the Minnesota Twins. So, uh, oh, Doug Minkiewicz is the guy who recorded the final out of the uh, 2004 yeah. World Series, and I wrote a song about it. Doug, but that's not why I wrote the song. The reason I wrote the song was that until Doug Minkiewicz came to the Red Sox, mm -hmm. I could never really uh, pronounce his name properly. Me neither. Yeah, well, you never got it. <laughs> until today. <laughs> until today. So, but once he got here, it's on TV, it's on radio, it's you know, it's, uh, it's in the newspapers. I learned to say it pretty quickly, and I, I found it to be a very uh, poetic. It had had a nice cadence to it. You know? it had a very. It's a very lyrical name. It had a poetic cadence to it that was, it was very nice. Duff McCabe. It just kind of really rolls off your tongue. So, uh, and it was kind of fun to say, really, when, once you get the hang of it. So I thought, well, if it's that much fun to say, it must be three, four, and maybe even five times as much fun to sing. To sing. So that's why I wrote the song.
name, there's no salt of Lamatria. Jared Salt of Lamatria. He had 15, 15 letters in his name. Uh, yeah. He's, that's the longest name in Major League history. Right. When I was uh, doing a radio for the Lowell Spinners, they had a guy, uh, Jason Schwindenhammer, who had 16 letters in his name, but, but yeah. he never got close to the Major Leagues. But. No, that's is he the most in all of baseball? Well, Salt of Lamaki is the most in I mean, in, in the minor leagues, too. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Maybe the guy that struck out 27 batters. He mentioned him. Oh. I can't pronounce it. Anyway, uh, so I told you about the Dump the DH campaign, and you were no doubt extremely impressed with that. So uh, the following year, I did another campaign, because I figured, well, now I'm a big shot, you know, I don't kind of know who I am. So I decided to uh, take on artificial turf. So uh, when you do a national campaign, you know, you got to have a catchy slogan. So here's my, uh, I did the same thing. I, I printed up bumper stickers and press releases and you know, brochures and everything. And uh, this is it, it's called Pull Out the Rug. And uh, at the bottom it says, uh, funded by the Alliance for Natural Playing Fields. I just made that up, you know, it's <laughs> but it just sound like good. Uh, so, uh, so I did this, I called up turf experts and everything, I did a lot of actual research into it, you know, and, uh, and uh, I sent, sent the bumper sticker and the brochure out all over the country, and it just never really caught on, though. not even close. I mean, it got written up in uh, USA Today and Sporting News and a couple other places, uh, New York Daily News, but it just never, uh, never really caught on. So I have a few hundred bumper stickers left over if you want one. Uh, let me know, I'll be happy to <laughs> upload it. And uh, about seven or eight years prior to this campaign, I had written a song about artificial turf. Because that was like the 70s, you know, when all the songwriters were writing protest songs. So, you know, I wrote a song about artificial turf, and I incorporated it into the campaign. And uh, didn't do much for the campaign, and the campaign didn't do much for the song, but I still like the song, so here it is. Mayonnaise, false teeth, and you know you got artificial colors in your food and for your hair. But that artificial grass is just too much for me to bear. If after a double day was alive, he'd be a gas. He went to a baseball game and didn't see no grass, just a big green carpet with some fancy white lines, a little bit of dirt, and those metric signs he could see as a turf. Astroturf, what a maze on top, Mother Earth, I don't want nothing beneath my feet that a horse can't eat, so take it away. It all began in Houston where they played the game indoors. Built a big dome stadium, but one of its flaws was the grass just wouldn't grow where the sun refused to shine. So they ripped it out and put in the artificial kind that put in AstroTurf. AstroTurf, what a big dawn's oh, Mother Earth, I don't want nothing in my feet where a horse can't eat. So take it away. actually had natural Eight. turf in the beginning. I used to do a whole segment about that. And you used to call it Astro Turf? Yeah, it's all, there's a whole story behind that. But I, when I added the uh, Tony Glottinger song, I had to cut something out of it. You know, so that was it. But I'd be happy to uh, give the information. Uh, I was stationed in Fort Hood, Texas, in the Army. And we actually went down to Houston one time and went by the old stadium. Like one right. day. It's probably the same yeah, Col destination. Col it was, uh, what was the original stadium? It was um, after the Astrodome. 
I'll, I'll be asking that time. Is it, is it in the same location today? Probably. It's probably across the street or something. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so this is a song about the uh, 1978 Red Sox. Do you know anybody remember what befell the Bucky Red Sox Dad. in 1978? Yeah. Bucky Dent? Yeah. Bucky Dent. Bucky Dent, right. You know, it's Bucky we'll, something then we'll, yeah, we'll go there. Bucky Dent. So basically what happened in 1978, the Red Sox had a 14 and a half game lead on the oh, end of July. I thought it was in August they did. Uh, it might have been. I don't think it was in August. 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 Anyway, they had, did have a 14 and a half game lead after the All-Star break. And uh, they frittered it all away. They had to, they wound up tied at the end of the regular season. They had to play a one game tiebreaker uh -huh. at Fenway Park. It was not a playoff game. It was a, it was a extension of the regular season. Where to go home? And uh, the Red Sox were looking good no, early in the game. Before, right? had Mike Torres was throwing a shutout. He has hit a home run. They were hit 2-0. Top of the seventh inning, and Bucky Dent came up. He was in this horrible slump, and uh, he only had four home runs the whole season to that point. But he uh, put one into the screen in left field, put the Yankees ahead to stay. They won the game, they won the division, they won the pennant, they won the World Series, and the Red Sox just went home because 1978 there was no wild card or anything. So they either won the division or that was the end of it. So. Uh, that was uh, kind of disappointing. Uh, my mom also uh, contributed to the song. She inspired it. She was a big Brooklyn Dodgers fan, and the, uh, the Dodgers had some, a funny house. They had some great teams in the '40s and '50s, and they could never beat the Yankees in the World Series. Although they actually did beat them one time in 1955, but every other time they lost. So the uh, battle cry out of Brooklyn every year was "Wait till next year," and uh, that's the name of this song. was the best damn team that I ever did see. It had strength up the middle. It had power and speed. Most of the season they could do no wrong. But when I could roll around, it was the same old song. Wait until next year. Wait until next year. What went wrong is all clear So near and so far Close but no cigar It's a long, long way till opening day And the winter's getting near Have another beer Wait till next year We all thought it was a piece of cake well, game lead at the all-star break, but the pitch was lousy, the hitting got worse, and the next thing I knew we were at a first. Wait till next year, wait till next year. It's a long, long way till opening day, and the winters get late. Have another beer.
exactly. I have a question. Mike Torres, was he pitching for the Yankees that day or the Red Sox? He was pitching for the Red Sox. Okay, I know that the Yankees had him before that. Ron Guidry was pitching for them. Okay, that was a Ron bad... Ron Guidry pitched uh, that was a into the seventh bad inning. Bad well, up to the and then Goose Gossage yeah. finished it up. Oh, my God. He was the end of that game. Smoke back then. Went right back to the, went right down to the last batter. Yeah, baseball. I do. Yeah. Not as much as this guy. Now I have another trivia question for you. Okay. Ted Williams, greatest, yep. uh, greatest hitter in Red Sox Correct. history, one of the greatest Four hitters eight. of all time. Four eight. Yep. Yeah. Uh, how many? He played 19 years in the major leagues. Five years. Uh, Five years in the service. Yeah. How many times did he collect 200 or more hits in a season? Never. <clears throat> Who said that? Never. Never did. That's really? correct. Okay. Why, Why is? was that? And what was his lifetime career back then? Like 325 or something like that. 340. Why did he yell? Why did he never have 200 hits in a season? Because he walked so much. That was oh, the primary reason. He, yeah. walked, he walked a lot. Of, his philosophy of hitting was uh, never swing at a bad ball and, uh, oh, you know, never swing at his ball out of the strike zone. He had an impeccable my eye. My father told me he was the only batter to have walked with the bases loaded. Intentionally In, walked. Intentionally it's, walked. It's possible. With the bases loaded. Yeah, he had the third most walks of all time. <clears throat> His on-base percentage was 482, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's like it means that almost every other game, almost time every game, game. Played, he reached on the hitter wall. It's ridiculous. That's high. Yeah. And even the year he batted 400, which was 1941, 400, hit 406, last major league at about 400. Uh, he had uh, 185 hits and 147 walks. Yeah. The weather of this past time in service, he would have um, the all-time record. Right. He would have... Oh, Challenge the home run record and, and everything else. Yeah, my father said if he had played those five years, it would have been in his, uh, been in his uh, prime of his career. That's right, that's right. He, was he, a good American. Might, have, he, was he good might have been up there with Ruth and uh, yeah. Aaron. But he was a good American. He, home was a he served his country and we, we appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, country. So, all right, anyway, uh, this is, one of the things that I love about baseball is that uh, it, had, it definitely has the best jargon, you know, the best expressions and the best nicknames. And so this next song is called Mendoza Line. Anybody know what the Mendoza Line is? The 200 batting average. That's right. But I, I forget the guy's first name. His name was Mendoza, the guy. Yeah, you'll feel... You'll, you'll, <laughs> it was inspired by Mario Mendoza. Mario. It was a prototypical... Uh, this guy's not a plant here. I have, a, I have a problem with his first name and Mendoza's <laughs> last name. Um, so Mario Mendoza was a prototypical... Uh, Slick fielding, weak hitting shortstop. He managed to stay in the major leagues for nine seasons based solely on his defensive ability. And he became infamous one day when George Brett, if you've heard, you've heard of George Brett, George Brett was, had started the season in a terrible slump and he was talking to reporters one day and he said something to the effect of, I, I was looking at the averages and I, I saw that I was below the Mendoza line. So that from that point forward, Mario Mendoza became this sort of tragic icon always associated with the uh, sub-200 batting effort. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to write a song about it, and so I did a little research and, and wrote the song, and then I recorded it. And, uh, you know, before you go into a studio, you got to figure out, well, what kind of song is this going to be? You know, what, what, what arrangement, you know, what style, what musical genre? So to my ear, Mendoza line sounds like something from the wild, wild west, you know, so... We did like a country and western version. We put together this great country band in the yeah. studio, and I actually invited them down here today to play with me, but uh, <laughs> uh, they're not here. I, I don't want to get into it. But I've got the next best thing for you, which is the karaoke version of the song, and there's a little sing-along part in it for you. So uh, take me about 15 seconds to uh, get this set up here. They couldn't get on their high horse and get down here. Yeah. So don't worry. <laughs> Don't get him going. Don't get him going. That's a proper ceremony in the summer. I'm not here to this awful slump. I need some luck to clear the hump. Or I'll be riding buses any day. I need a hit so bad that I can cry The worse I do, the harder I try That night if he looks like a mile away I'll take a little flare, a lucky bounce 
Baltimore chopper to skip me across That old man goes and die Of course I prefer the frozen broker Swinging butt, give me hope I got across that old man goes and die Here's the single off part Man goes and die Man goes and die Skip me across that old man goes and die Man goes and die I got across that old man goes in love. Now I'm at the old Mendoza for whom this life name was an actual big leaguer for 600. In 86 games he played short and second, a little third and quite a lot. So I've heard which was essential because he barely hit his way. Oh no, his infield utility set the benchmark for futility, flirting with 200 all the time. Now in 79, he got an all time mark for the most game played in a big league park with an afterglow. The man goes alive. I'll take a blue player, 16 hopper, a lucky bouncer, a Baltimore chopper, just get me across. That old man goes alive. Of course, I prefer the frozen rope, swinging butt, give me hope, I got across that old man goes and lie. Let me hear you now, come on. Man goes and lie, man goes and lie. She must be up my cross, that old man goes and lie. Man goes and lie, man goes and lie. I'm feeling my cross, that old man goes and lie. This is the only song where I can take a drink in the middle, so I'm going yeah. to do that. Do your Frank Sinatra. He made the playoffs only one cent. Here's his stats. Three games played and one hit in five total at-bats. Do the math correctly, you will surely find. <laughs> Right smack dab on that pen goes and die. So if you're struggling on the field or any part of life, think of that brave soul south of the border. He plugged and scrapped his whole life through on it to be linked to an attitude of true or lord of a different order. I'll take a blue from the copper, a lucky bounce. Baltimore chopper just get me cross That old man goes and I like cross That old man goes and I like cross Of course I do the first floor to the open Just a good butt Get me caught by God's cross That old man goes and I like Last time Man goes and I like Man goes and I like I'm feeling fine Just get me cross That old man goes and I like cross That old man goes and I like Man goes and I like I'm feeling my cross, that old man goes and lie. Just get me cross, that old man goes and lie. Get me cross, that old man goes and lie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Does he know he's been immortalized? I don't know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, let me introduce the members of the band. Uh, directly behind me on the drums is Chris Anzalone. Play along, please. Yeah! On the bass, Rob Ignazio. On my left. Yeah, hey, Rob. On my right, an electric guitar and mandolin, Steve Mayone. Yeah. And on backup vocals, I did all the backup vocals. And, and there's a reason. And your name is? And there's a reason for that, because, you know, you go into a studio, when you hire professional singers, it gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. So I did all the vocals myself, and uh, I only charged myself half as much. So I, uh, I saved quite a bit of money. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, this is just some oh. cheap publicity stuff to promote the CD. Well, let me tell you something. You're right. You got me. So it's called Baseball's Greatest. It's volume two. It's got a... Mendoza line on it and uh, the Johnny Damon song. I'll play the Available on the table there for you. Know. I have a question. Five bucks. You remember yes. the catcher who hit, had about a 200 career batting average back in the 60s? Bob Uecker? Bob Uecker. Yeah. Great defensive catcher. Yeah, he was. Couldn't hit it. had a good sense of humor, too, and he's still broadcasting. Yeah, he's in yeah, yeah, he's yeah, in that movie uh, oh, with the major leagues? 
It's what? <laughs> in the movie Major League. Major, Major League, yeah. yeah the movie. funny, and he was also on Webster. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now where was I? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> goodbye. CD. Okay, so um, you know, a lot, a lot, you know, football season starting up now, and a lot of people think that uh, football has supplanted baseball as the national pastime. I, I, I tend to dis disagree. I think more people care about baseball, understand it, listen to yeah. it on the radio, yeah. read about it, know the players, know yeah. the rules, um, have either played baseball or softball or something like that. So I, I think baseball is still firmly implanted into our psyche as, as the national pastime. And uh, a few decades ago, the uh, late great comedian George Carlin mm -hmm. did a, a terrific comedy piece be dippy, uh, <laughs> uh, comparing <laughs> baseball and football, and I'd like to share that with you right now. Okay. Baseball is a 19th century pastoral game. Football is a 20th century technological struggle. Baseball is played on a diamond in a park, the baseball park. Football is played on a gridiron in a stadium, sometimes called Soldier Field or War Memorial Stadium. Football, you wear a helmet. Baseball, you wear a cap. Football is concerned with downs. What down is it? Baseball is concerned with ups. Who's up? And football, you receive a penalty. Baseball, you make an error. Football has clipping, spearing, piling on, personal fouls, late hitting, and unnecessary roughness. Baseball has the sacrifice. Football is played in any kind of weather. Rain, sleet, hail, snow, fog. But in baseball, if it rains, we do not go out to play. Baseball has a seventh inning stretch. Football has the two minute warning. Baseball has no time limit. We don't know when it's going to end. It might, we might have extra innings. Football is rigidly timed and will end even if we have to go to sudden death. And finally, the objectives of the two sports are completely different. In football, the object is for the quarterback, also known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy in spite of the blitz even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground attack that punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. In baseball, the object is to go home and be safe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got a couple more songs left. I want to thank you guys for uh, hanging out with me for an hour here. Hey. My name is Howie Newman. My website's howienewman.com, and feel free to check out the uh, memorabilia in the next room over there. I do have a uh, American League baseball there, yeah. and uh, some photos and some articles and things like that. So. Did you catch that at the ball game, or did you? I caught it in the press box. Oh, during okay. the for you. In Fenway. At Fenway Park. Yeah. Actually, I didn't actually catch it. It came into the press box and bounced around, fell on the floor, and I picked it up. Good. I did catch one ball, though. Would you believe? No, just no I did. I, <laughs> caught, I caught one ball as a fan. I my son a caught two in one game. You caught two in one game? No, my son. Oh, your son did. Wow. I caught a minor league baseball. Are you ready for this? Fraser Field in Lynn, Massachusetts. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I used to work for the Lynn Islanders. Uh, Lynn Sailors at the time. They were the Seattle Pilots. Yeah, I Double A right. Pilots. That's right. I'm which are now the Milwaukee Blue Jays. So this is a song that, it's not really a baseball song, but they, they played at Fenway Park. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Feel for the time. Oh, I know what it is. Neil Diamond.
about 20 years ago, there was a member of the Red Sox staff, and uh, he and his wife had a baby girl named Caroline, so they played that in the eighth inning, and everybody was like singing along and getting, you know, getting really uh, into it. So they said, well, we'll try it the next night, you know, and it just kept happening, so they just adopted it full time. They, they There's also a story we had the 17th stretch. Yeah. Uh, I, saw, I forget how long it was, years ago. Grover Cleveland. The was president. it? He and got he up to leave in the yes. seventh inning and everybody stood up, so that's how they got yeah, to leave. Yeah, it was in the seventh inning. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How did that? Yeah, some guy decided it once. So, anyway, uh, actually, how I, I got to do this show was we, I played a duo called Knock on Wood and we were doing an uh, outdoor concert right across right. the street here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Somebody Steve was nice enough to bring my yeah. like, Cardo. Who was that? Who was that? Somebody was nice enough to bring my business card. Oh, he did. We both have them. He, yeah. he got here before me. Cool. Well, thank you. You got the. Got the uh... they, uh, we have a few more shows. The uh, I have a couple more baseball <coughs> shows. None of them remotely close to here, but uh, there's the schedule is on the table. And uh, not kind of what we're doing. We have two or three more shows left. Also, actually, ones in New Hampshire, and, New Hampshire, Clinton, and Maine. I think are our last three shows. Anyway, but. This song is written in, this is the most famous baseball song of all. I figure I'd finish with this. Written in 1908 by Albert von Tisler and Jack Goldworth. Neither of whom had ever been to a baseball game prior to writing this song. So apparently they weren't terribly convinced about their subject matter, but that's neither here nor there. I think you know it, so please sing along. Yeah. 
Yeah, at least. Thank you very much. Yeah.